The next talk <coughs> will be by uh, Nancy Norton. Nancy is a holds the Saint Chair for Marine Science and Invertebrate at the Smithsonian Institute, National Museum of Natural History. Her research interests include marine biodiversity and conservation, ecology, evolution, behavior, and systematic of coral reef organisms. Among the positions she held and held are a professorship at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. She is on the board of director of Coral Reef Alliance, editorial board of Annual Review of Marine Science, and she is the founder of Scripps Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. Among her honors, she is uh, on the board of director of uh, AAAS, and she has the Peter Benchley Award for Science in the Service of Conservation. Nancy, please. Thank you very much for coming to this session. Um, it's actually wonderful news to hear about the Marine, Biodiverse, uh, the Marine Institute at the Mediterranean. Um, as a marine scientist, it's very exciting to see the possibility of uh, adding to the wonderful work that's already being done uh, in the Red Sea to uh, really study the Mediterranean as well and the comparisons that are possible. I'd also like to ask, uh, thank my our, my, the host, uh, the committee that organized this, and especially Tamar. Tamar, are you out there somewhere? Yes? I can't see you. Tamar? Well, maybe see. Um, I, I did want to, when she returns, I wanted to give her a book uh, on behalf of all the people that she has hosted from abroad um, to very generously and uh, very enthusiastically. I know I speak on behalf of all the foreign uh, visitors that uh, we've already had a wonderful time here in Israel. There. Ah, Tamar, come back here. <laughs> this is for you in any case when you want to pick it up. And uh, <laughs> you, you missed some of my nice words about you, but I know when people say nice things about me, I just blush, so maybe that's just as well. Anyway, thank you very much on behalf of me and everyone else on, that you've invited here. It's been fantastic meeting so far. So uh, what I'd like to do today is talk uh, a bit about... Uh, marine biodiversity, and in particular what we don't know about marine biodiversity. I think that's very important in the context of the fact that Israel not only has a long tradition of studying marine organisms, but is in the uh, position of uh, setting up this wonderful new museum in which marine organisms will play an important part, and, uh, and thinking about what we could still do with marine organisms is a big part of thinking about any new endeavor, including the museum. But before uh, I go into what uh, we don't know about marine organisms, I would like to say a few words about the, what we do. And, it, and the, the bottom line is that the ocean in general is facing an enormous crisis due to a combination of local and global stressors. And um, these stressors are actually quite diverse. Unlike the situation on land where you can really point to habitat destruction, uh, as was noted uh, this morning as the primary cause of uh, extinctions and threatened species on land, in the ocean we have a whole bunch of different things that are going on. Uh, which, and, and essentially you can think of the, what we're doing to the ocean as a giant experiment. We're putting lots of things into the ocean and then we're taking lots of things out of the ocean. So on the input side we're putting nutrients from uh, agriculture and sewage, toxic materials from uh, industrial activity, sediments from poor coastal construction and deforestation, invasive species, which we've heard uh, uh, quite a bit about already this morning. Uh, and then, of course, the big global thing that we're doing is putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which both warms the atmosphere and hence the ocean, but it also dissolves in the ocean and makes the ocean more acidic. So we're actually changing the basic physics and chemistry of the ocean in addition to all these local stresses. And on the output side, we're essentially taking out anything big. This includes not only the big fish, uh, which we've largely removed from most marine ecosystems, but also in the process of removing fish, we are doing a lot of habitat destruction, trawling, for example, much of the large uh, three-dimensional structure from the, from the global ocean uh, seafloor. So we're doing this huge amount of change 
local and global. And it's perhaps, an, given the scale of the change, uh, it's not too surprising that we're facing a lot of crises in terms of ocean ecosystems. I have to say, it used to be thought that the ocean was so big that people essentially assumed that we could do anything to it and nothing would happen. And uh, sadly, we now know that's not true. So for example, in terms of fisheries, this is a, a diagram showing what fisheries used to look like in 1900. So this is tons per kilometer square. You can see uh, over 10 tons per kilometer square. This is the North Atlantic. Um, 1900, large areas of the coastal ocean had vast uh, productive fisheries. That's the picture in 1900, and this is the picture in 2000. Then we have the problem of dead zones, which are caused by nutrients uh, flowing uh, into the coastal ocean. So we have really lots of them along all of the coasts. This is actually an old graph. I think the, now, the total of uh, the number of dead zones is closer to 400, uh, but it's a big problem wherever there are large concentrations of people. Um, we have toxic algal blooms, um, which my husband sometimes refers to as the rise of slime. Here you see one uh, coming ashore on the coast of Florida. These are not only obnoxious and uh, uh, very unpleasant and discourage tourism, but they actually put people in the hospital because they cause asthma and eye irritations and other medical problems. And then we do, in fact, also have uh, invasive species, as I mentioned. You saw one example, which was the killer algae that uh, Dan Simberloff uh, uh, talked about. This is a, a more recent invasive species, which uh, has come to the Caribbean from the uh, Indo-West Pacific. It's the lionfish you see here. And it, it shows many of the characteristics that Dan talked about. Uh, here you see what the, where it used to be found when it was first uh, introduced. It was, uh, this is hard to see, up 1998. And so you can see there are only two, uh, two locations here. And then here is the uh, situation in 2009. And that spread actually took place over the course of really just two or three years. It essentially rapidly colonized the entire uh, Caribbean. Now the problem with this fish is that it's sort of like the Nile perch, if you will, of the Caribbean. It e eats everything it can find. Uh, so here you see the results of an experiment with uh, with lionfish and without lionfish, and this is the recruitment, the number of baby fish coming on into a patch reef, and you can see essentially that lionfish eat all the baby fish that arrive in a location. So this is uh, done and has continued to do a lot of damage. Now, um, this whole wholesale destruction or degradation of marine sea ecosystems, actually for me it's a rather personal study, uh, personal story, it's uh, one that began when I was a grad student. Uh, this is one of the first pictures I ever took as a grad student. Of course, as a grad student, I was only seven, so I'm not really that old. But, um, so here you see the picture, those of you who are used to looking at coral reefs, this is all living coral, this branching and heads, and it's a little hard to see in this light because there's some light shining on it, but all this is living coral. Now, we, we um, knew at the time that this was not a pristine reef, and we knew that because um, what you don't see in the picture, which is any big fish. So you see a few fish up here in the corner, but those are all small fish, only about five centimeters long or so. The plankton. And so all the big fish were already gone even by 1975 on the north coast of Jamaica because the people on the north coast of Jamaica are very poor and they're essentially taking anything they catch, could catch to feed their families. Now, um, despite the fact that we, there were no fish uh, in this system, those of us who were studying reefs at the time took the living coral completely for granted. Uh, we, never, we studied a whole variety of things, uh, never worrying about whether the reefs themselves were in any trouble. And that turned out to be a huge mistake because within about uh, seven years of mice uh, arriving on the north coast of Jamaica, those reefs had changed from coral reefs here to seaweed reefs. And we lost, a, we went from about 70% living coral to less than 5% living coral over the course of just a few years. So very, very sudden collapse in the entire reef ecosystem. And uh, this was not, unfortunately, limited to Jamaica. Here you see a, a meta-analysis. This is, again, percent living coral cover, which uh, ranges from a little bit over 50% in 1977 across a, a broad variety of studies down to less than 10% by uh, 2002. And in fact, in the Caribbean, there's been an 80% loss of living coral in, in the last three decades, essentially across the ent my entire 
career as a coral reef scientist, which is why I say it's a very personal story. I think anyone who's a marine scientist of my age is, is almost always also a conservation scientist because you can't watch this sort of thing happen uh, around the world and not uh, feel uh, uh, kind of driven to do something about it. And um, this, unfortunately, is not even just a Caribbean story. Uh, so um, other similar analyses have been done for the Pacific. So here you see uh, the uh, so summarized by that this is about where the average living coral cover for Pacific reefs are is about 20 to 25 percent. So although it's not as bad as the, as the situation in the Caribbean, it's about halfway down this, this trajectory of decline. And uh, as a consequence, uh, Fairly recently, about, it was estimated that about one-third of all coral species are actually at risk of extinction, which puts them on the same uh, par in terms of extinction, threatened status as, say, for example, amphibians, which I'm sure many of you know are severely threatened, uh, largely because of disease. And uh, finally, uh, in the context of coral reefs, uh, it's worth noting that it's not just the loss of the living coral cover because corals are ecosystem engineers. They, coral reefs are very, very dynamic ecosystems. You can think of them almost, if you look at, for example, the skyline of Tel Aviv, and you see construction cranes and you see wrecking balls. And the reason Tel Aviv exists as a city is because uh, the construction cranes are outpace, outpacing the wrecking balls, and so you still have a city there. Well, coral reefs are really the same kind of ecosystem. You have living corals creating new structures, and things like fishes and sea urchins and other things that eat uh, coral skeletons destroying those structures, and so it's a dynamic balance. And when mortality exceeds new growth, essentially what you have is coral reefs turning into sand. And this is what you see here in this figure of Barbados between 1950 and 1991. So this is the same reef uh, view, uh, viewed from the air, and you can see that whole parts of the, like for example, this whole part of the reef is missing in this figure. And in total, there was about an 18.5% loss, not just of living coral cover, but actually of the reef itself. And a little bit later on the talk, I'll go into why that loss of the rock, even though it was necessarily not living, uh, is so important for thinking about marine biodiversity. So I'd like to start with uh, what, in a way, is the simplest part of the diversity on a coral reef. And I'm going to focus on coral reefs simply because um, it's something I know a lot about. And actually, as it turns out, a lot of the ocean's diversity is not tied up in coral reefs. So a coral itself as an animal is fairly simple. It looks sort of like a tin can with a lid cut off, and so you've got the mouth here surrounded by a ring of tentacles and this very simple sac-like structure which has the digestive organs um, and uh, the reproductive organs here, one opening. And then inside the living animal are all these Things. These are dinoflagellates in the genus Symbiodinium. They're sometimes called commonly zooxanthellae. And then in addition to the zooxanthellae, there are all these other microbes, bacteria, archaea, and fungi, and viruses. Uh, and the, really the story of the last 20 years in terms of understanding the biodiversity of this, this entity, which we often call the coral holobiont, is this increasing cryptic diversity, diversity that exists, that, but until we studied it, we didn't know it was there. So I'll begin with the easiest part, which is the coral animal. And I say it's the easiest part, but many of these studies took 10 years uh, to figure out, so it wasn't actually necessarily easy in terms of uh, labor, but it's easy in terms of the number of players that are involved. So this is a, this is a coral that is very common uh, in the Caribbean. It used to all be called Monastria annularis, and in shallow water it had formed these big heads, and in intermediate depths these columns, and in deep water these plates. And uh, it was um, so common uh, that it was almost like a lab rat for both geologists and biologists. It was the most commonly studied coral, and it had been abundant in the Caribbean for about three million years. And it was a textbook, case, considered a textbook case of ecological and morphological plasticity, and that's because it was assumed that this one species would change its shape in order to maximize its ability to capture light. I mentioned uh, just now that there were all these dinoflagellates living in the tissues of corals, so that makes corals essentially de facto photosynthetic organisms. And uh, the idea was that they flatten out as they get in deep water to maximize their ability to capture light for photosynthesis. 
But despite the fact that this was considered a textbook case of phenotypic plasticity, the reality is that these are actually three completely different species, Monastria faviolata, annularis, and franksi. But it took about 10 years of work uh, combining natural history. And I mention that in particular because sometimes people think that the easiest way of getting at these uh, cryptic species is genetics. And genetics is often very important. But with corals, actually, genetics turns out to be very hard because they typically sim simply don't have much genetic variation. So you can do a lot of genetics and not see any differences. But if you realize that these things, for example, all reproduce at different times and have these different um, large-scale morphologies as well as small-scale uh, morphological differences combined with the genetics, it was possible uh, to, to finally recognize that these were three species. But it took 10 years. And these were, I'd, I'd like to remind you, that the, the most common corals in the Caribbean, they've been studied for decades. And until we started working on it, no one even knew that it was more than one species. Now, it's, a, not even, it's not just species that are a problem with corals. Uh, it's also the higher level uh, relationships among the different groups of species or families. And so here you see uh, the results of a lot of work looking at the fam essentially the family tree of stony corals. And uh, you can tell right from the outset uh, that there's some problems here because this is the, a very common family, Favias. These are common actually in the Red Sea as well as in the Caribbean. Um, and the problem here is that you find things that are conventionally called favias in all these different parts of the tree. This is a, the tree is very long, so there's, this part of it connects to this part that connects to this part. The whole thing is very, very long and won't fit in one uh, dimension. Uh, so we lined it up in two pieces here. But you can see that favias are all the way through this part of the tree. And of course, it's not just the favias, it's the mussids and the pectinids and the merulinids and the Peridids and the agrosiids and the euphilids and the oculinids and the meandrinids and the sidrostraids and the astrocenids. And it turns out, in fact, that two thirds of all the families of uh, stony corals uh, aren't actually good families. And there's no textbook that you can consult that pulls this all together, and no keys that reflect this modern uh, revision of the relationships. Uh, but, but this is, in fact, the reality. We'll take a biologist another 10 years or so to put it all together to find the new defining morphological characteristics that, that, that uh, describe the true monophyletic groups. One of which actually turns out to be this family down here, which had never even been recognized as a family. It's unique to the Atlantic Ocean, and it combines uh, members of a bunch of different families. It's only found in the Atlantic Ocean. And it also emerged as a, a new entity in the course of these studies. Now, turning to the symbiodinium, the zooxanthellae, as I mentioned, these are dinoflagellates. They're sort of distantly related to the things that cause red tides. And uh, they were long thought to be a single species, a symbiodinium microadriaticum, found not only in corals, but also giant clams and some sponges. And the reason they were thought to be a single species is because under the microscope, they essentially all look like this little green balls. Uh, and you can't do much with them morphologically on that basis. But if you use, again, the techniques of uh, genetics, in fact, this work was really revolutionized first uh, by Bob Trench using protein electrophoresis and then by Rob Rowan, who was actually a Drosophila geneticist, who, but who just really liked corals and started looking at their DNA. And ultimately, we came up uh, as a result of a lot of work now. This is the family tree of the zooxanthellae that live with uh, all sorts of marine invertebrates. And you can see there are a number of different uh, groups that are named A through uh, G on this uh, family tree. And four of those groups actually live with corals, A, B, C, and D, which are shown with the arrows here. And I, I'd like that this, it's a little hard to tell just from this tree how different these things are, but the differences between these major groupings, these clades A through G, are actually as different as free living orders or families of free living dinoflagellates. So these are not minor genetic strains or minor differences. These are equivalent to, you know, cows and rats of the zooxanthellae world. They're very, very different indeed. Now, um, we knew that they were evolutionarily different, but one of the really interesting things about this uh, work has been the connection between this evolutionary divergence and some of the ecological divergence, particularly in light of this phenomenon which you see illustrated here, which is coral bleaching. Now, coral bleaching uh, is the breakdown and the symbiosis in that, in that intimate association between corals and these zooxanthellae. And what happens uh, is when, it, when the corals essentially dump the zooxanthellae out of their tissues, they go 
pale white, as you see. This is a reef, a picture of a reef uh, taken in September 2010. And over here you can see a, an individual, one, a, a coral species that actually has a very large polyp. And at least those of you in the front can probably see this clear area around what in the, is in the center. This is the stony skeleton. It's as if uh, you were walking around and your muscles and your tendons and ligament and skin all went completely transparent and you could just see your bones. That's what you're seeing here. So the, the coral animal bleaches, it loses its color, you can see right through it. And, but because the zooxanthellae are photosynthetic and give a, a, quite a bit of the, the food that they produce to the corals, Corals that bleach like this eventually starve to death and die if they don't get their zooxanthellae back. And this coral bleaching is caused by uh, any kind of stress. It can be caused by really cold temperatures or really warm temperatures. It can be caused by uh, too much light or too little light. And it can be caused by unusually low salinity. So any kind of stress will do it. But of course, in the context of global climate change, in particular global warming, it's high temperatures that we're really worried about. Now, it turns out that this evolutionary diversity of the zooxanthellae Valley was incredibly important ecologically as well. And we first got an indication of this by actually looking at which zooxanthellae live where on a coral reef. This is work uh, done in uh, collaboration with Rob Rowan. And what uh, was done was he took little, sort of a mini transect across this column of Monostranularis. It's only about 10 centimeters tall in total. And as I say, you can't tell them apart um, by looking at them, but you can tell them apart using genetic fingerprints. So this is the fingerprint of type A, and this is the fingerprint of type B, and this is the fingerprint of type C. And so here you can see at the base of the column, you've got the fingerprint of type C, but as you move from this low light environment to the top of the column with lots of light, you get start getting that diagnostic band that's found in type B. So you get this perfect replacement of type C to type B just by moving 10 centimeters along that light zonation within the column of the um, the coral colony. In fact, it's a gradient that's almost, it's, these are some of the best behaved uh, ecologically behaved organisms I know of. This is actually a serial dilution done in a test tube from pure type C to pure type B. And you can see this looks almost like a serial dilution. Now, this is a clear indication of the relationship between the type of zooxanthellae and the light level, which makes sense because they're photosynthetic. And then you can do the same sort of thing from shallow water to deep water, and again, get a gradual transition from either types A or B or type C. And the reason this turned out to be so interesting in the context of coral bleaching is that for a long time, we'd, we'd find very weird spatial patterns in bleaching, which we couldn't understand. For example, here you see a shallow water coral that's only bleached on the base and not on the top, whereas at the, during the same bleaching event, uh, in deeper water, the corals were bleached uniformly. And this sort of thing made absolutely no sense until we realized that, in fact, this is t uh, one type of symbiodinium living on the top and another kind living on the base, and this is another kind living in deep water. And it turns out that type C zooxanthellae are much, much more sensitive to warm water than types A or B. And so the entire pattern of bleaching uh, became much more comprehensible uh, and uh, in the context of uh, this, this threat posed by global warming. And so the question now in terms of uh, coral reef conservation is can this diversity in the zooxanthellae actually help corals or reefs adapt? And in fact, if you go to some places uh, in Panama where we've worked quite a lot, this is, this is the distribution of different zooxanthellae types from a single species of coral. And you can see it has type A, type B, type C, a new type C2, and type D. And this type D is especially important because uh, it is much uh, more resistant to temperature than any of the other kinds of zooxanthellae. And so the idea is that, uh, it, that corals might be able to selectively maintain type D in their tissues and actually um, make them less resistant to the, uh, less susceptible to the effects of climate change. And this is important because, uh, as it turns out, corals bleach with a very, very small uh, increase in the local temperature. For example, if the temperature gets about one degree centigrade above the normal seasonal maximum, you start seeing bleaching. And that's very worrying because here's the global climate uh, record with respect to temperature, and here's the projection for the future. This is one degree. And so what you can see from here is by about 2050, in the absence of the ability to adapt, we'll have bleaching occurring uh, on a very, very regular basis. But this type C zooxanthellae might raise that threshold up to about two degrees or perhaps even a bit more and buy us a lot of very important time while we figure out how to deal with this carbon dioxide 
problem. And, and this bleaching, as I said, is, is something that we really have to worry about. We can't Bleaching, for example, in 1998, uh, there was a major bleaching event in the Indian Ocean. About 80% of the corals bleached, and about 20% of them died. So if you have bleaching on an annual basis, if you can imagine the trees in Tel Aviv losing all their leaves every, and saying that 20% of the trees that lost their leaves died, and if that happened every year, pretty soon you wouldn't have any trees in Tel Aviv. Well, this is why coral reef biologists can be very depressing to talk to. Um, now, it's not, of course, just coral... Uh, Bleaching is also coral disease, and here you see four pictures of di different disease syndromes. This is white band disease, black band disease, white plague, and I can't remember what that one is called. And I think you can tell just from the names that we don't know very much about what, what causes these disease. Uh, in the United States, we have something called the Center for Disease Control, and if it's, it's as if we had something like the, in the center, we have institutes for cancer and, and various you know, known entities, but it's as if we had institutes for headaches and stomach aches and, and foot problems in a general sense. I mean, it's, it's, these are symptoms. These aren't descriptions of what's causing them. Now, in a few cases, we actually do know, that for, for example, the constituents of this black band. But many of these diseases, including this one, which can kill corals at the rate of about two centimeters a day, uh, are still remain to, we, we still don't know what causes these disease, diseases. Now, what we do know is that this, this disease is a, is a very serious threat to the diversity of coral reefs because of the mortality it can cause. And uh, here you see a picture of uh, coral suffering, again, from black band disease, 1988 and 1998. So in the course of a single decade, you've lost the entire colony. And um, the, because they grow so slowly, only one to two centimeters a year, this is a hundreds of years old, this colony, and it wiped out in the course of a decade. And this, this is actually even a more serious disease that affects the branching corals. So here you see a picture in uh, 1971 and 1988, and you can see the head coral is still alive, but all the branching corals have died, not only in that picture, but actually throughout the entire Caribbean. So this coral and its congener, Acropora cervicornis and Acropora uh, Palmata were the first uh, corals to actually put, be put on the U.S. endangered species list, and about 98% of them have vanished uh, in the Caribbean, uh, really, uh, in the last couple of decades. So the question then is, why is there so much disease now? And this is, again, a question of understanding biodiversity, just as it was with the zooxanthellae. Uh, and, and it's a much, actually a much harder question to answer because the diversity is so high. There are essentially two schools of thought, one having to do with the idea of specific pathogens, the other the idea being that the conditions, the environmental conditions are so uh, destroyed that um, the, the, Im the immune system of the coral uh, has been uh, depressed enough so that any old opportunistic uh, bacteria can grow out of control and make the coral sick. Uh, but there's huge numbers of potential candidates which, for diseases, which is what makes it so hard to actually understand what's going on. Quite a while ago now, we uh, did a very preliminary study of three species of corals, just about 14 samples altogether. Each one was only about a centimeter uh, in diameter. And we did it in the old-fashioned way, which was uh, uh, cloning and sequencing. And just in uh, those uh, 1,400 sequences, there are about 240 species of bacteria. But if the statistical analyses suggest that if we'd kept sequencing and sequencing until we'd sequenced everything in the sample, there would have been about 6,000 species of bacteria in just those 14 small samples. Of course, now we can use next generation sequencing, and the, that just makes the problem harder. Uh, this is a recent analysis of uh, 300,000 sequences uh, from a single species of coral using next generation sequencing. And um, the vast majority of them are actually completely unknown. Those that are known are a mixture of bacteria and fungi and uh, viruses and archaea. And so when you have hundreds of thousands of possible candidates for pathogens, it actually becomes a deeply difficult problem. And then uh, the last uh, example I want to discuss in the context of the importance of diversity is one actually that has been very well studied here in Israel by uh, Mouse Fine and Danny Chernoff, and you see their illustrations here from a paper in Science. Um, the, as I mentioned, carbon dioxide dissolves in the ocean and makes it more acidic. And in these, these are maps of what the ocean used to look like and where it's heading. And in these maps, red is good and blue is bad. So by the time you get to 2100, the conditions for skeletal formation for uh, most coral species is likely to be fairly suboptimal. And what, um, what uh, 
find in Chernoff did was grow corals, a, a single species of coral in water like it's likely to be in 2100, given business as usual scenarios. And what they found was that the coral completely loses its skeleton, it utterly decalcifies, and it turns into uh, uh, little sea anemone-like structures. Now, I think everyone in the coral reef uh, community was shocked that the corals would survive so well. I mean, they're actually still alive. But of course, there's a big difference between uh, this kind of structure and this kind of structure. You're never going to have the Great Barrier Sea anemone protecting the coast of Australia, and this is the worry uh, if everything were to look like this. But the reason I mention this in the context of biodiversity is when I was in Elat a couple of years ago, I went to talk to them because this paper is so famous and I wanted to hear what was going on in the lab. And what they said is they've started to do the same experiment with lots of different corals, and they don't all respond the same way at all. Some of them do this, but some of them grow just fine in water that has a pH of like what it'll be in 2100. And so once again, we're in a situation where the biodiversity, understanding the biodiversity is absolutely critical for predicting uh, and managing uh, a future acidified ocean. Now, as I mentioned, the, um, the sea anemone-like survival of some of these corals is not too, um, not too optimistic in terms of the protection of coastlines. It's also not too uh, optimistic in terms of providing the three-dimensional structure that a lot of coral reef organisms depend on. So here you see one of the, actually one of the very few analyses that have been done to look at the relationship between the diversity of reefs in a broad sense and, the, and either the amount of living coral or in this case the amount of three-dimensional complexity there is. What you can see is the more complex the coral reef in terms of its three-dimensional structure, the more different kinds of organisms there are. And this is a kind of pictorial illustration of what happens when you lose a lot of uh, three-dimensional complexity that Linky, I think, looks very lonely. And um, so what's likely then to happen uh, if, we lose, all the, if we, ha we lose all this coral cover and perhaps even more importantly, we lose the, th the three-dimensional structures that make corals what they are? And it, the consequences are actually enormous. And it's, it's, not for, it's not arbitrary that we call coral reefs the rainforest of the sea, although uh, inspired by a book I read, uh, I think it's much more appropriate to consider uh, rainforests the coral reefs of the land. But whichever way you want to call them, that they're, they have similar features in terms of their biodiversity, and in particular, just the way trees are not the, critic, the, not the primary contributors to biodiversity in tropical rainforests. Similarly, uh, corals are not what make coral reefs mega diverse. There are only about a thousand species or so of reef building corals, but if you look at what lives with, with corals, for example, here you see the undersurface of a coral, the estimates, and um, I'm sure Stuart's going to. Uh, uh, drop this figure way down, but some of the published estimates are that there might be somewhere between one and nine million species of reefs, uh, reef, uh, species living on reefs in total. Um, whether it's one to nine million or half a million, what, uh, if you look at some groups, for example, fishes, where we have a fairly good understanding of species, the numbers of species in different parts of the world, but one quarter of all um, marine fish live associated with coral reefs. And so if you extrapolate from that, you can assume that something like a quarter and perhaps more of all the organisms that live in the ocean live associated with coral reefs, which is actually a staggering statistic when you recognize the fact that if you took all coral reefs on the planet and squashed them into one place, the total area is only about the size of the country France. So there's a mega diverse community in, in not that big of an area and a very highly threatened area. Some of these are actually also very beautiful as well. So uh, I've talked about just the total diversity uh, in terms of what we do know, but it's also true that there are a lot of, there's a lot of diversity on, on reefs that we, we don't know as well. Uh, this is, I think, a really uh, striking example. You see here a uh, crown of thorn starfish uh, overgrowing a coral reef uh, in Australia. Now, crown of thorns are one of the most conspicuous uh, organisms on reefs where they occur, which is over much of the Indo-West Pacific. And they also have done 
been devastatingly effective predators, wiping sometimes 95% of the living coral off of reefs over the course of just a few months. And so you'd think we'd know what species the, the crown of thorns starfish is, but in fact, it turns out that this thing, which was, again, thought to be one single species, turns out, and this was discovered uh, less than a decade ago, was actually uh, four species, not just one. And this has a lot of implications for, in terms of understanding where outbreaks of uh, a crown of thorn starfish come from. And of course, it's not a problem that's just limited to reef organisms. I want to make that clear. This, is a, this may not look like a taxonomic uh, illustration. It's not. It comes from La Russe Gastronomique. But it, I, sh I show it to uh, illustrate the fact that, again, things that we think we know really well, things that we've been eating for centuries have turned out to be cryptic species, including uh, the mussel here that Dan Simberloff mentioned, although I have to say I'm not sure I entirely agree with his notion that if you've seen one mussel, you've seen them all. But it is true that we've had, um, we've, had, uh, we've, we've had a lot of trouble figuring out the cryptic species in mussels, uh, shrimp, and essentially everything that we eat in the ocean has, uh, or most of what we've eaten, eaten in the ocean has had its taxonomy transformed uh, in the last couple of decades. Now, why do we have so much trouble with marine species? And I would argue that it's actually, and this is, I think, very important in, in the context of thinking about developing collections and a biodiversity program for the, for the museum here in Israel, is that part of the problem has been that our traditional approaches uh, result in the loss of many really important characters. And that has been coupled also traditionally with the notion that marine species are, wide, are, are assumed to be very widely variable and also widely distributed. So when I started thinking about cryptic species, I would routinely find descriptions of things that were supposed to range, say, from the Red Sea to Brazil to Antarctica and anywhere from a meter to 200 meters depth. And, um, and what was going on here was that people were just assuming that something looked sort of vaguely similar in these different places was all a single species. Now, uh, actually, in a, uh, on Friday, I'm going to go off bird watching with a bunch of my colleagues, and I'm not a very good bird watcher, but I have the advantage of, um, I guess, who else has said they weren't a good bird watcher? I can't remember, maybe it was Dan. Um, I'm, I depend entirely on keys like this one. The problem is that um, this is a key. This is a key to the birds of uh, the hummingbirds of uh, Colombia, and, and I can make a good shot at identifying uh, the hummingbirds in Colombia thanks to these keys. But for marine organisms, what we've traditionally done essentially worked with keys that look like this. We've essentially xeroxed the keys before we've started to study the diversity. We've put all the organisms in alcohol or formalin, or we've taken the flesh off entirely and just thrown the bones in a drawer. And as a consequence, you can imagine it would be really, really hard to identify the hummingbirds of Colombia with this kind of information. And that's a big part of why we're only in the last couple decades recognizing that the diversity in the ocean is much greater than thought. And this is a, a, a typical example of a situation where this, this organism, which was supposed to thought, it was a, it's a kind of snail, a cowrie, was supposed to occur throughout the Indo-West Pacific. And it's turned out using not only genetic, but also color pattern differences, color pattern differences which were ignored by systematists for, for decades. Every single one of these dots, as it turns out to be a different species. So, this is part of the reason uh, we did a, we, when it came to the census of marine life, we felt it was very important to get a handle on what was going on in terms of the diversity of coral reefs. Now, our part of the census only took uh, about five years, so we're clearly, we're not going to census one quarter of all marine diversity in five years, and so we decided instead, rather than trying to census everything, or even, and which we obviously would fail to do, to develop the methods that would allow us to get a better handle of what the diversity of the ocean might be. And what we did was develop a combination of uh, uh, using DNA methods, initially DNA barcoding, using a single gene to categorize species without trying to put a name on it. And as um, um, was stated earlier, most of the marine species don't have names in any case. And then combine this with standardized sampling. And that's been a big problem with understanding marine diversity. One person will go off, say, to a lot and study the diversity using one method, but somebody else will go to the Philippines and use different methods. And in the absence of any kind of standardized methods, it's very hard to compare the results. So what we did was use standardized volumes of reef rock, essentially anything they could fit in a five-gallon bucket, and also put out what are these little kind of uh, condominiums or dollhouses for coral reef organisms, and they would crawl in during the course of a year. And then we would analyze the, everything that uh, lived in these known structures, either these or these. And what we found, we've, we're really just beginning to do this work. We've looked at diversity across about seven places, 
across the world's uh, coral reefs, ranging from the west coast of Australia to Panama. And just 6.3 meters squared of footprint, in other words, uh, if you add up the, 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 the basal area of these structures or these structures, has a, almost the diversity of, uh, in terms of crabs of all the crab species that have ever been described from Europe. So 6.3 square meters, like more or less smaller than the size of the stage, all the diversity of Europe. So you can imagine that the scale of the problem is enormous and we're a long way from really understanding what the diversity really is, although we do know at this point that it's very large. And uh, as is typical of a number of such studies, these, when you do this kind of thing, these are the different places where we worked in Morea, uh, Australia, and uh, Central Pacific and Panama, the numbers just keep going up. And so even though there are four, over 4,000 sequences in this study, it's clearly not even close to enough. And so you think to yourself, you know, how are you going to uh, figure out what the diversity is? And this is the way it's traditionally done, which is looking at the relationship between species, uh, numbers of species and area, and I think Stuart is going to demolish this approach uh, subsequently, but I'll present it, to, if nothing else, to show what its limitations are. So uh, we looked at 6.3 meters square. The total area of coral reefs is about 600,000 square kilometers. And so you should, in principle, be able to calculate the number of species based on area and this wonderful little no magic number Z. But the problem with Z is that we don't know what it is, and the estimates are incredibly sensitive. Uh, to what we assume. So for example, if you have a Z value which is uh, 0.1, then the total number of reef crabs is about half the total number of described crabs. Whereas if Z is 0.4, it's about 800 times the number of described crabs. So clearly the, the trying to do it in this fashion is not going to be very simple. Uh, and it's for that reason that, again, next generation sequencing, people have really come to feel as a, a potentially very powerful approach. And the idea is basically you take um, the contents oh, this is, uh, of, of one of these dollhouses or dead corals, put it all in a blender, uh, amplify the DNA and sequence it. And it's, we are now actually, this turns out to be a little bit harder with this kind of thing than it is with, say, microbes. But in a recent analysis that we've done, uh, in a, just a single one of those settlement structures, we got about one-third of everything that had ever been reported from Array after a five-year intensive uh, uh, biodiversity um, uh, survey using DNA barcoding. So the potential for uncovering huge amounts of diversity is enormous. Now I'd like to close with a few examples of relationships among organisms in addition just to their numbers. This is a food web of a coral reef in uh, the Caribbean. What you see is about 30% of the species, which are all these little dots around the edge and only about 11% of the interactions. And of course, if we showed all the species and all the interactions, you just have a black circle, so you wouldn't be able to see very much. But uh, one thing you can see when you present it this way is that uh, some of the interactions are much more important than others. And it turns out some of these really important interactions are, are exactly those that are affected by human activities. So the question is, what happens to food webs as people enter the scene? And uh, one of the things that uh, I was lucky enough to be able to do is go on a cruise in 2005 across the Northern Line Islands, which range from islands with fairly large numbers of people, about 6,000 in the case of Christmas Island, to uh, Pamara Atoll, which has no people. And what you can see just from these illustrations is that you go from coral reefs that are essentially all seaweed and no fish to coral reefs that are all coral and coral and algae, this pink stuff that cor baby corals like to settle on, and lots of really uh, big fish. And in fact, uh, the changes are really striking. I see, as I said, a big increase in coral and coral and algae, but the, perhaps the most surprising are these upside down food webs. So here's, uh, these are fished reefs and these are uninhabited reefs. You can see about 80% of the biomass of the fish fauna on these unfished reefs is actually top predators. So it's as if you went to the Serengeti and there were 10 lions for every antelope. And in fact, when these and related data started coming in from remote places, ecologists told us it was absolutely impossible to have a food web like this. There must be something wrong with the data. It turns out that unfished ecosystems uh, in the ocean routinely look exactly like this with most of the biomass in top predators. And the reason we don't, haven't traditionally re recognized that is, as my husband likes to say, we ate everything before we started to study it. So um, it's, not just the, it's not just the bottom and the fish even, it's also the microbes. We heard a little bit about the microbes. As you go from um, fish places with lots of people to places without, uh, without many people, you see 
big decreases in viruses and bacteria, increases in pathogens, all the sorts of things that we heard in a related way that we heard about right at the beginning from in Ilka's talk. And so the effects of humans on food webs are utterly pervasive, affecting every single piece of the food web in ways that we're still uh, working to understand. So this brings us to the conservation implications of all this diversity. And uh, I don't know what the saying in Hebrew is for a straw that breaks the camel's back, but this is the essence of how marine ecosystems work. Uh, there are multiple stress... Boy, I'm really losing this point now. There are multiple stressors uh, and complex causations. The whole phenomenon of sudden collapse, such as we saw in Jamaica. This problem of irreversibility, which I haven't really mentioned much, but many of the recovery scenarios are, for example, we lost most uh, to a disease, a single species of sea urchin, which the females released millions of eggs over the course of a year. 30 years later, it still hasn't recovered. And then finally, it's extremely costly to try to repair severely damaged ecosystems. It is like taking a, a camel or the broken back to the vet. It's very expensive. So this means that individual protection is really not an option. We can do this occasionally for rare species like this beautiful California condor, but for most of the marine species, it's just not viable. And what the, the essence of conservation for marine ecosystems is, is to build resilience so that ecosystems can bounce back on their own. And that's because things happen, uh, like this hurricane, which came to the north coast of Jamaica, uh, turned the reefs into a parking lot, and for scale, these trees are about uh, 10 meters tall. Uh, Lots of different kinds of disturbances are normal uh, in marine ecosystems. These are the hurricane paths in the Pacific and the Atlantic uh, for the last 150 years. And marine protected areas are a critical component of that, and I'm very glad to hear that in addition to the marine protected area you have in Eilat, there's a very well-developed plan for marine protected areas across the Israeli coast of the Mediterranean. That's going to be a critical part. It's not the only thing uh, that, that has to be done. You have to worry about water quality and watershed management, but these are really crucial ways of protecting diversity. And I, I wanted to end with this because um, this is a story... Um, this story reminds me of Tamar, actually. I hope she hasn't left again. Um, this, person, um, this person, a very poor fisherman on the coast of uh, Baja California, he and his uh, very small family decided that their fisheries were going to hell and no tourists wanted to visit them and they had to do things differently. And so they set up this marine protected area here. And this is what, the, this is what it looks like now. And here you see before and after uh, this Cabo Pulmo National Park, it's huge increase in the number of fishes, including, again, you see these top predators. These are places that have, are unregulated, and these are government, uh, government protected areas which are unenforced. And so you can see that the only way you get really effective working of a marine protected area is to have people behind it. And that's why I thought of Tamar, because this is kind of a hero for Cabo Pulmo, and I feel like Tamar is a hero for biodiversity here in Israel. And... Um, and, these, and these, these protected areas actually do a lot of good. It's not just that there's more fish in them. Here's, again, uh, work that from the, these remote islands in the Pacific. And you can see that with the increasing protection, so this is fished uh, and this is unfished, you get more, uh, more baby corals and uh, less disease. So we actually, in terms of the near term and a local scale, which is, of course, what I think concerns all of us, including uh, those of you here in Israel. We actually know what to do when it comes to marine ecosystems. We have to control fishing pressure, and we have to make sure water quality is good. That buys incredibly important time while we start to figure out the really hard stuff, which is uh, reducing carbon dioxide emissions and uh, preventing extinctions, which I think is the topic of Stuart's talk. So this is our grand challenge to make sure that ocean life survives the Anthropocene. Thank you very much.